Houston, where he's principal of a Bible college there, and as we have been saying, greatly used of God in a ministry of revival, not only in the British Isles, but uh, throughout different portions of the world. This is not his first visit to Canada, but I believe it's his first visit to Regina. So we welcome him and trust that God will minister through him to us tonight. Before we turn to the Word of God, I should like to say one word of thanks to the pastor for his very warm and very gracious words of welcome. I'm sure I'm happy and privileged to be with you here this evening. Indeed, I feel very much at home already uh, being motored to the church. I saw Lawrence Street and uh, was certainly impressed. I presume called after Lorne in the old country, Argyleshire, that part of Scotland in which I was born and brought up and also brought to a saving knowledge of the Lord Jesus Christ many years ago when the district of Lorne was swept by revival. So uh, I do feel at home with you, being so near to Lorne Street. Then, uh, I do trust you will not find it too difficult uh, to follow my Scottish Highland accent. Uh, Gaelic is my native language. I uh, think in Gaelic, but I've got to come down to your level and talk to you in English. However, I'm sure that uh, the good Lord will help us. And now will you turn with me to the portion of Scripture which we read together, the Acts of the Apostles, chapter 4, and we shall turn again to that very familiar passage, verse 28. For to do whatsoever thy hand and thy counsel determined before to be done, and now, Lord, behold their threatening, and grant unto thy servants that with all boldness they may speak thy word, by stretching forth thine hand to heal, and signs and wonders may be done by the name of thy holy child Jesus. And when they prayed, the place was shaken where they were assembled together, and they were all filled with the Holy Ghost, and they speak the word of God with boldness. And the multitude of them that believed were of one heart and of one soul, neither said any of them that all of the things which he possessed was his own, but they had all things common. And when they had prayed, the place was shaken where they were assembled together. The burden that is on my heart this evening for this meeting is that of a message on the Holy Ghost in revival, or God in revival. It will be generally agreed that uh, the world we knew a few years ago is gone beyond recall, at least so far as man is concerned. Ideas and habits that seem to be part of the solid foundation of things have been completely abandoned and are being remembered today as that which belongs to the vanished past, the God, the God. 
Now it seems to me that in this shaking of things, we are Christian men and Christian women must ask ourselves what is the church doing today? What am I doing today to establish and advance the kingdom that cannot be shaken? In other words, what are we to offer a generation that uh, is awake but is failing to find the answer to the supreme problem of the age, and the supreme problem is sin. I know of no question in all the range of thought so vital in its issues, so devastating in its implications, ask this one question. Is the Christian church today, I speak as a Presbyterian minister, is the Christian church today a light that marks the road that leads men to the land? A lighthouse, for instance, can be very imposing. The structure, perfect, the work of a master. But that structure in the ocean could be a positive danger to navigation, but for the light. It's the light that gives warning. It's the light that gives direction apart from the light, a positive danger to navigation. There are institutions today in the world, they certainly are to be found in Britain. They speak of them as churches. But I have no hesitation whatsoever in saying a positive danger in a Christian community because they lack the one thing that can alone constitute the Church of God, the power, the presence, the anointing of the Holy Ghost. It was my privilege some time ago to address a, convert, uh, a congregation of uh, clergymen of the Church of England under the chairmanship of the Bishop of Plymouth. I want to read to you words spoken by the Bishop in his chairman's remarks. Might I suggest that the serious question that confronts us today is not that the state of our country is so bad, but that in a country that claims to be Christian, the Christian witness has been and is so feeble and ineffective. How is it that while we make such great claims for the power of the gospel in practice, we see so very little, now I want to note this, we see so very little of the supernatural in operation. Of course, you believe that the work of God is supernatural. A Christian is a supernatural being, or is not a Christian. He is a person who has had a supernatural experience. 
and is so supernaturally altered that in the moment of his conversion he is characterized by godliness in every part of his being, body, soul, and spirit. I believe that the regeneration of a soul, not is a man brought into saving covenant and vital relationship with God, is a man who knows the miracle working power of God in his life. I say again that regeneration is God's greatest miracle, far greater than the creation of worlds. Worlds will fall, will break, will burn. They will wax dim in, the, in their orbit. They will fall like leaves in autumn. I believe that day is coming. But the deathless soul who has known the miracle of the new birth will survive the wreck of a million worlds. He's alive in God, the God that is eternal. Eternity is in his this miracle. Well, in this portion of scripture which we have just read, we have miracles demonstrated. When they prayed, oh, the place was shaken, and multitudes were added to the church. That is God at work. God at work. Now one naturally asks, what had the early disciples that the church lacks today? How is it that we're not witnessing miracles? How is it that we seldom hear the cry of the penitent? Or a man under deep distress of in his search after reality in God, what had it? There's only one answer to that question. They had the Holy Ghost. In other words, they believed in the personality of the third person of the Trinity, God, of the Holy Ghost. And it was the impact of God, the impact of the Holy Ghost, not the eloquence of Peter, not the logic of his heaven, but God, the Holy Ghost. Now let me illustrate by an incident that I shall not touch on on Sunday evening. I was in a church one evening in the northwest of Scotland. I was asked to assist at a communion service. Now in that part of Scotland, a communion lasts for several days. It begins by a prayer meeting on Wednesday night and finishes by a thanksgiving service on Sunday night or Monday night. On this occasion I was asked to preach the action sermon. That is the main sermon of the community. I felt the going extremely hard. The parish, the district had not been visited by anything in the nature of revival, God was sweeping through communities sixty odd miles away, but not in this community. Halfway through my address, 
I noticed that a young boy, 16 years of age, who was saved in the revival and who had come to this communion service, I saw him weeping bitterly. Tears flow in the Bible. We seldom see tears flowing today. Oh, thank God I saw them in Toronto last week. And God, in his nasty bitterness, is weeping. And I realized that the boy sitting in the pew was nearer to God than the minister in the pulpit. And I stopped it. And I asked him to pray. Converted about six weeks or thereabouts, had a remarkable experience in the baptism of the Holy Ghost. I trust to believe in the baptism of the Holy Ghost as a definite, distinct experience. This young lad had it. So much so that a party had to go out in search of him. He went out to herd some cattle on the hillside. God met with him and he's lying among the heather with wave after wave of divine realization sweeping through him. So much so that he forgot all about time and home. But they found him there. Well, I'm asking him now to lead in prayer. And that boy, too, in that part of the country we stand as a prayer and we sit to sing, he stood. The congregation stood with him. He's looking up toward the heavens, he's praying. And in his prayer he says this, God, I seem to be gazing in through the open door. I see the Lamb in the midst of the throne. That morning in family worship, they were reading the fourth chapter of Revelation for John saw the door. A door was opened in heaven. And he prays, I seem to be gazing in through the door. And I see the Lamb in the midst of the throne with the keys of death and of hell at his girdle. And then he paused, began to weep, strangely moved by God. After a little, when he was able to control himself, he began again. Looking toward the heavens, he cried, God, there's power there. Let it loose. And at that moment, the miracle happened. Oh, my dear people, have you witnessed the Bible? Have you seen God at work in the field? God moved into the midst of men in that church. And suddenly, half the congregation slumped on the top of each other. About between 80 and 100 fell into a trance. Now don't ask me to explain this because I can't. Read the history of revival. Jonathan Edward revived in New England. The 59 revival in Ireland and in Scotland. The 104, 1904 rather, revival in Wales. These were characterized by physical manifestations that cannot be explained on the basis of the human. We have to acknowledge that God is in it. And God was certainly in that visitation. But the most remarkable thing that happened that night was this, that at that very moment, and this was happening in the church, a village five miles distant from the church suddenly was gripped by an awareness of God. There wasn't a single minister near it. No special effort. Nothing in the nature of evangelism. A sleeping village. Suddenly 
gripped by God, the Holy Spirit moving into the homes of the people. And here and there, a whole family, in the matter of hours, brought to a saving knowledge of the Lord Jesus Christ. The place was shaken where they were assembled together and multitudes were added to the church. And the following day the churches in the parish were crowded. And God moved in in such a manner that there was hardly a house in the whole community, in the whole parish, but had someone in it who found the Lord Jesus Christ a Savior, in some cases, whole family. That God, that's what God had that boy that seems to be lacking in our ministry today. He had the Holy Ghost. He's today a minister in southern Arabia, a missionary under the auspices of the Church of Scotland, and his ministry has been wonderfully blessed among Mohammedans. God, the Holy Ghost, doing the baptism of the Holy Ghost, the filling of the Holy Ghost, is the answer to the missionary problem today. I'm convinced of that. Now it's quite obvious that uh, the early disciples had certain fundamental convictions. They believed in action rather than entertainment. These are days when a great deal of emphasis is placed on the need of entertainment. I want to read an extract from a letter that I received from a group of ministers in London. You may have heard of Theodore Bamber, an outstanding preacher in England, he signed the letter along with others. We are at our wit's end to know what to do with our young people who made decision for Christ recently at Haringey. They are demanding all sorts of entertainment, and if we do not provide it, we just cannot hold it. Tragic. I say tragic. Where is the Holy Ghost? Where is the gripping truth of God? It's lacking. Ah, but the early disciples believed in unction and not in entertainment. One of the sad features that characterizes much that goes under the name of evangelism is this craze for entertainment and this emphasis upon what man himself can do. We can do this, we must do that. And if we do this and that, then God is sure to work. I was arrested by an address given by one of our workers at the minister's conference recently. I refer to a young worker in our own mission that will be visiting Canada shortly. She made this statement. God is not obliged to send revival because we work toward revival. He's not even obliged to send revival if we pray. But he is bound by covenant promise to send revival 
when we humble ourselves and seek his face. She was, of course, speaking from that great passage, Eat my people, call by my name, will humble themselves and pray, and seek my face. I in heaven will hear, and will come and heal their land. That is the attitude and the approach that God honors. They believe in unction and not in entertainment. Or oh, to say, how can we get the teenager? How can we get the teenager today that in many parts of the world seems to be going wild, living in utter disregard to high principles? How can we get him? Well, how did they get them in the early days of the church? How are they getting them just now in many parts of Northwest Scotland? Thank God we are seeing movements of the Spirit. And I wouldn't say that we're witnessing revival such as we witnessed in 49, 50, 51, 52. But teenagers are being arrested not by special effort, not by publicity in the field of evangelism, but because of the prevailing prayer of men and women. I saw that happening recently in Ireland in a most mass manner. A group of men giving themselves to waiting upon God. A group of men anointed by the Holy Ghost and praying in the Spirit. In touch with heaven, brought heaven down. So that I witnessed this. A godless sinner stopping me on the street. As he left his car coming over to me and said, I was in the meeting last night. Will you show me the way to God? Felicity? No. Unction. God. The Holy Spirit. I read part of that letter to you. But I didn't tell you that they asked me what entertainment did I provide in the Lewis and Harry's revival. What entertainment? Well, I couldn't help smiling when I read that. I wrote back and said that I took nothing at all to do with the arranging of anything in the nature of entertainment. But I left that to the young converts themselves. And uh, they found their entertainment in five prayer meetings a week in each five, five prayer meetings. And indeed, they found their life and they found their entertainment. I was saying to the students at the college today that I cannot understand all this talk about follow up work. Well, you may not be talking about it in Canada, but I can assure you they talk about it in Britain. You can't have a crusade or a special effort in the field of evangelism without uh, arranging for men and women to follow up those who have made a decision at the crusade, such as Billy Graham has, or others. Call on them and try and get them interested in the church. Try and get them to come to some place of worship. Follow them up. My dear people, I just can't understand it. 
surely a person born again of the Spirit of God needs not to be followed up. Why? The moment he comes into vital relationship with God, aspirations are created that find expression in his attendance in the prayer meeting, far less public worship in the church on Sabbath. Aspirations after God, as the heart panted after the water brook, so panted my soul after thee, O God. Don't misunderstand me. I believe that there is a need, a great need today for instruction in the word of God because of so many of our young people, yes, and old people, Ignorant of the word, there is a need for instruction. But oh, don't tell me that a person who has found the Savior needs to be followed up. He'll search out for green pastures. And he'll find there where food is given that will nourish the hunger after God in his soul, he's born again. Of course, that doesn't follow in every case where there's only decision. Decision. Oh, the thousands today in our land of energy who are living under a self-created illusion and going on in contentment to a Christless hell who made a decision and because of them having made a decision led to believe that they're Christians. There never was a greater delusion forged from the anvils of hell than that. That doesn't make me a Christian. Making a decision, joining the church, becoming a Sunday school teacher or an elder or a minister. That doesn't make me a Christian. A Christian is that person who knows the power of the Holy Ghost bringing the personality of God to be incorporated in his personality and suddenly making this profound discovery that heaven has invaded his Yes. Oh, how great, how great our need is to rediscover the personality of the Holy Ghost in our work and witness to God. I labored as a Presbyterian minister for 17 years. I was, I should imagine, fairly successful as a minister in three congregations in Scotland, but there came a moment when with a sense of baffling and frustration, I said, God, if you cannot do something better for me than I know now, I'm giving up the ministry and going back to this. Listen to your people. God next. When I found myself at the end of all human resource, and no one need come to me and say there isn't such an experience as the baptism of the Holy Ghost subsequently from that. God next. A professor in New College, Edinburgh, faced me with the question, what difference has this experience made in your ministry? Well, I said, following that dissertation of God in my own study, I went forth to preach the same sermons that I had been preaching for 17 years. Of course, I was evangelical. But you can be as dry as a cork yet be very fundamental, such as my case. I went out to preach the same sermon, but with this difference, 
But now I saw hundreds weeping their way to Jesus. That's the difference. That's the difference that the Holy Ghost made. Oh, we are laboring and tiring out hell and seeing little accomplished, but oh, let God come. Let God come. I'm an old soldier of the First World War. Some of you may have been there. I was there. And you will recall that awful morning when the Germans sent over clouds of poison gas. The clouds came right over the Highland Brigade of the 51st Scottish Division. The thing was terrible. Well now, what could we do, officer, or non-commissioned officer such as I was? What could we do? Would I suggest that we call all who could stand to fix their bayonets and charge the cloud of gas? You die. Foolish! Or would I get onto the line and get in touch with the battery and cry all with all haste, get the batteries to fire on the clouds of gas? Folly. Folly. That wouldn't stop the havoc and the dying and the desolation and the destruction. The miracle has you read it in history. A miracle has the wind changed. And one breath of wind did what the ingenuity of man could never do. It blew the clouds back to the German line. Wind did it. Breath did it. Oh, what an illustration of what is possible when God the Holy Ghost moves in. We are living today in an atmosphere that seems to me to be impregnated by satanic power. Horses are let loose that are out to defy every known Christian principle. And we organize and we have our conventions and our conferences and we pass our resolutions and we organize in an endeavor to counter this general movement in the world. But the movement's advancing. Oh, for a breath of God to come, the winds of heaven to blow, and soon we shall see communism and all the other isms that have their origin in hell right back to the caverns of death from which they came. But God, my dear people, we've seen it happen. We've seen it happen, and it could happen again if the Church of Jesus Christ would again recognize the personality of the Holy Ghost. And then might I say that here were men who put power before influence. And they put the power of God. Ye shall receive power after that the Holy Ghost is come upon you. And the Holy Ghost came upon them. And power invested them. Multitudes, multitudes in the valley of decision. And the church of Jesus Christ born in the night. 
because they put power and before influence. Now, I think it will be generally agreed that uh, the state of the world today presents a challenge uh, to the Christian church. There is a growing conviction among true thinking men that unless we witness a demonstration of the power of God that will lift men beyond the ordinary into the sphere of the extraordinary, beyond the natural into the sphere of the supernatural. The average man that we know will look upon us, will stagger back, disappointed, disillusioned, and despair. The early church conquered said glory. Because the early believer, in the power of the Holy Ghost, outlived, outfall, and outdied the pagan here, a quality of life that could not be explained on the basis of the human. I see again, until we rediscover that, and with purpose and true intention to God, we shall go on preaching our evangelical sermon, but the multitudes of path us to hell. You remember Paul and Silas in prison? Why? They hadn't sufficient influence to keep them out of prison. That was bad enough. But they had so much of the power of God as to shape the old prison to its very foundation and listen to the cry of the penitent. What shall I do to be saved? Not in for I believe that the hour has come when preachers and pastors and evangelists must forget influence and proclaim the whole counsel of God to a bewildered, a bewildered world. The apostles were not men of influence, not many wives. Not many don't know them. God has called the foolish, the weak things, this thing influence, but prepare to honor God. Oh, give us such men. Give us such men. Men who will put Reputation aside is necessary. And stand with God in his endeavor to bring a lost world back through the preaching of the everlasting gospel based on fundamental truth. What have they then? What have they? They believed in the Holy Ghost. Notice the prayer of verse 29. And now, Lord, behold their threatening, and grant unto thy servants that with all boldness they may speak thy word, by stretching forth thy hand to heal, that signs and wonders may be done by the name of thy holy child Jesus. You see, they looked for signs and wonder. And because they looked and expected, they saw signs and wonder happen. We saw that in Ireland, in the town of Lisburn, 
just six weeks ago. I question if I witnessed anything like it outside of the heavens. Suddenly, through the singing of one of our workers that I've already referred to, that will be visiting Canada shortly. She's an outstanding singer. But she sings under the anointing of the Holy Ghost. And she sang a lovely hymn that speaks of the blood getting deeper than the stain can go. The blood reaching deeper than the stain can go. And as she sang wave after wave of God came over the meat. It's eight o'clock. The benediction is now pronounced. And I sit down and she sits down. And then an elder of the church rose to his feet and said then, God, Mr. Campbell has sat down. Miss Morrison has sat down. Now you get to your feet. Strange words. Now you get to your feet. And demonstrate your power. We were in that church until 20 minutes past 11. No one thought of leaving. The cry of the penitent. The cry of Christian men seeking to get right with God. Again and again men would say, God, let the blood reach deeper than the pain that troubles me. One farmer was crying bitterly. Oh, let the blood reach deeper than the pain that troubles me. That's God at work. They look for signs and look for wonders. And that happened. I close by quoting a verse from a hymn following the quotation, Then Peter filled with the Holy Ghost. That's a significant word. Filled with the Holy Ghost. If you're full of the Holy Ghost, you cannot be full of anything else. God means fool. Every avenue of my redeemed personality, under the control of God, filled with the Holy Ghost, and God now moving in my food. Here is the empty the thou may fill me, a clean vessel in thine hand, with no power. But as thou givest graciously at each command, I take the power of Pentecost, I take the promise, Holy Ghost, but who save me to the uttermost, I take the underpaid, the casting. And if I obey the laws of the Spirit, the power of the Spirit will obey me. Miracles will happen. Multitudes added to the church. And men bowing before the crown right of our crown will be this old testament first of all it speaks to me of a crisis creating a sense of urgency a crisis creating a sense of urgency in the case of the lepers the crisis came when they were made to face their own dire and desperate need. Listen again to what they said. If we stay here, we die. Here you have 
a personal consciousness of need and a personal conviction that they themselves must do something about it. I wonder if I have here a far-fetched comparison suggesting the desperate need of our own land today and perhaps the need of our individual life is there not a famine today a famine for righteousness a famine for true godliness a famine for the movings of the spirit of god in the midst of men i may call to say this morning that the streams of vital christianity never ran so low as they seem to be running today. Take the world that you know and the world that I know today. Are we not in the midst of a world that is rocked in a sea of trouble because We've left God in the land of forgotten things. We have said we can get on without you. That is the desperate condition and state of the world today. Not that man, generally speaking, is more wicked than in other days, but he is certainly more God. I received a letter from one of our workers laboring in the center of England. And in her letter she said this, The average man in the average village in the middle of England is either an atheist or an agnostic. And here I am speaking about Britain, I can't speak for your country. But my deep-seated conviction is that the crying need of this momentous hour in world system is for a manifestation of God. Is it true that Canada has never known revival? I've been told that. You had movements in different places. You had manifestations of God in some communities. But I understand from the pages of church history in the realm of revival that Canada has never witnessed a nationwide manifestation of God no, the need, the crying need, the desperate need is for this manifestation. Not just church activity, not just conventions and conferences for the deepening of spiritual life, not just gathering together to discuss the question of revival. All that may be helpful and has its place in the economy of grace. But the need of this hour is for something altogether different from anything that man can conceive of or man arrange. A manifestation. Sounds from heaven. God stepping into the midst of men and demonstrating his how the God who threw worlds into space by the touch of his hand, demonstrating that power in the midst of man whom he hath created and whom he judges and will judge. That is the picture you have here. A people moved, a situation saved, 
because of something happening that man of himself could never accomplish. Just a sound from heaven. 